Today the message is titled, Fulfilling the Calling that God Has for Us. Fulfilling the Calling that God Has for Us. And I want to look at uh, uh, 2 Kings. We're actually going to start in chapter uh, 19, at verse 19. 2 Kings chapter 19, uh, verse 19. We're living in a degenerate generation. And... Uh, we're approaching fast a time where being a believer, I really believe, is going to be against the law. Things are sliding that fast. And the sad thing is that Americans are so wrapped up in themselves and their hobbies and their habits and what they want, they're allowing the enemy to take charge of so many things by ungodly men and women there are passing policies that truly are not what God has for us. But the other point of this is there's tremendous revival going on throughout the world. Literally more people are coming to know Christ today than ever before. And there's a great harvest that's ready to be harvested. And we've got to go back to Luke 10 too. It says, pray ye therefore, Lord of the harvest, to send forth laborers, because truly the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And you and I need to be laborers in that. So our first point today is this, what a time to be living for Jesus. What a time to be living for Jesus. 1 John 5, 19, for we know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. Amen. And so it's not a time for us to live in fear, to get caught up in a bunch of doubt, but it's a time for us to engage and invade the darkness and to make a difference. Now, the good thing about today is I didn't have any caffeine, so you're going to be safe. And, uh, uh, you know, and, and in Isaiah 6, 3, it says, and one cried to the other, the, the angels, there, the cherubims, actually, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. God does not share his glory with anybody. Amen. And so when God uses you or God uses me and tremendous things happen, we need to point it right back to him. Because it's all, the only reason God uses us is because of his mercy and grace. Amen? And we get that opportunity to be uh, used. Culture is casting aside morality. Uh, and, uh, and we see that all around us. That's why we're seeing mass shootings. People going and shooting people up. Terrorists around the world blowing people up. Some of this stuff has gone on for a long, long time, but we're seeing more and more of this in America, and it's because our culture is casting aside morality. And we're removing fathers from homes. Most people in prison came from a fatherless home. And so the enemy knows, and so does the government. They know if you impact the family, you'll change the country. And we need to understand that. We need men to rise up and to do that. That's, uh, Matt Poole is going to be heading up our men's ministry here at the church, challenging you men to take greater steps starting in January, to do more for the kingdom, to do more in your family. And Adam's excited about that, what Matt's going to do. Um, there's not a judge or a legislator that is going to solve the world's problems. There's not a judge or legislator that's going to solve America's problem. No matter what they say, they can't do it. Amen? We only have one hope, and that is reformation, revival, and you, through Christ. Let me say that again. We only have one hope. That is reformation, revival, and you, through Jesus. And it's you and I. I mean, he sent out the 12, and the world, it spread all over the world, the gospel. What could he do? with churches that really believe who he is and stand upon his word. Five cities could be turned upside down. As a matter of fact, I believe it's in Matthew 28, he doesn't say, go change your city. He doesn't say, you know, go change your state. He says, go change a nation. Go into all the world. And we're limiting what, well, man, I'm just having such a problem in my family. And you know what? That's because you're looking at your surroundings. You're not thinking bigger. You're not seeing. If you see somebody in the family and they're struggling and you're like, man, they cost me so much money. They've cost me so much time. They've cost me so much pain. They're so negative. You need to say, God, show me them through your eyes. Show me them through your eyes. 
You think we're battling flesh and blood, but it's a spiritual battle. And time and time again, I tell the Lord, when I, when I run across somebody that's just down on me or whatever, God, show me them through your eyes. What are you trying to do? What do you have for them? Let me see their potential so that, God, I can grasp that. And that's where prayer comes in. It's so important to be a people of prayer. Jesus told us that, the, that we hold the answer within us. Yes, the culture is corrupt. Yes, the generations are declining. That's all true. But revival is flourishing like never before. I'm sitting at a Mexican restaurant last night. I'm there by myself eating my food, and I hear in the booth across right, right on the other side of me, I can't see the people. There's a couple and a gentleman. That's all I know. And he's talking to them, and he's loud, and he's expressing everything really loud, and he's having a few beers, and he's just getting louder, and he's like, I'm telling you, I've got your answer. So I'm just eating my chips, and I'm listening. I said, this is going to be good. He looks at the lady. He goes, would you care if I held your hand? I'm going to read your palm. You see, I have your answer. And he starts reading her palm, and, and she and her husband are, are just popping in, and I'm like, and I walked out of there. Everything within me wanted to go sit in their booth with them. I mean, it did. I just wanted to rise up, and the Lord's like, no, this is not the time. This is not, I'm just, I just want you to listen. And I got in my car. Of course, when I stepped out, I did look around. I wanted to see who they were. But the Lord said, they're so hungry for spiritual things. They've come to a restaurant, and they're letting a stranger pour into them. They're all around you. Tell my body to get busy. Tell my body to get busy. They're hungry. They, we have the answers, but yet we're so caught up with, well, my wife doesn't like me, or this doesn't, or, or my job's just so demanding. We're so caught up in us. Or I'm limping today, and I need to get this done. Or, or I'm, my, my back's are. We are so consumed with us. And trying to give advice to others that we don't need to be giving. Amen? The body of Christ is alive and well. Turn to your neighbor and say, that's you. That's you. You're alive and well. I was listening to a testimony, and this, they were going to a pumpkin patch, and they put them all in a big wagon, and they were going over there, and there was a, a little lady on the wagon, and she was kind of groaning and hunched over sitting down there, and the father was telling this story. He says, my three-year-old, let's go in my hand. And he goes over to her, and he says, Jesus can heal your pain. And he's wanting to grab his kid and like, oh, my goodness. And she looked up at the little boy, and she said, what? Jesus can heal your pain. Can I pray for you? And the little three-year-old takes the little old lady's hand, and he prays for her. And she's like, oh, my goodness. It's gone. It's gone in little three. I told you, Jesus can heal your pain. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Childlike faith, reaching out, but we're still caught up in, well, why isn't this happening? Why aren't people doing this? I don't like this in the church. I don't like that in my life. I don't. Stop it. You're just a bunch of whining complainers. God's like, please get busy about my kingdom. You can work your life to death, but it's not going to matter if you're not making a difference in the kingdom. You can have all these things, but it won't matter if you're not making a difference in the kingdom. You're with people in your family, and you're making them common. And they're uncommon. And you're treating them in the wrong ways. God says, stop it. I've called them. They're anointed. God has something special for them. He wants to use them in a greater way. You've got sons and daughters that are on the verge of deciding whether they're going to make a decision for Christ or they're not, and you're so busy about you. 
or you're so busy battling your spouse. Fulfill your calling. The true church is doing just fine because Jesus is their rock. Amen? And the gates of hell will not prevail against them. Yes, the world is wicked. But again, Isaiah 6, 3, the whole earth is full of his glory. Just start looking for God's glory around you. It's there. Keep your gaze upon Jesus. You've been invited to be a part of it. Man, our best days are before us, amen? I love that statement I made last week. God removed Joseph from his brothers because they were a hindrance to him. God will remove you from settings you never thought you could get out of because of the hindrance that is around you. But you're not to battle it in your flesh. I wrote this down. I choose to focus on God's goodness and not man's shallowness. I choose to focus on God's goodness and not man's shallowness. Ephesians 2.10 says, we are his workmanship. You operate in the prophetic when you see from heaven's perspective. You operate in the prophetic when you see and you look at it from heaven or God's perspective. That's important that we get this. The full scripture there in Ephesians 2.10 says, We are his workmanship created in Christ for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we shall walk and work in them. God's already prepared the good works for you. You just got to be attentive and get in there. So the second point today is you need to make prayer a priority. You need to make prayer a priority. It's not enough to say, I'm going to pray for Phil Kimmer. You need to pray for Phil Kimmer. It's not enough to say, well, I'm praying for my kids while I'm out doing everything else, and I can spend three hours at a basketball game or a football game, or I can spend six hours doing this, but I spend five minutes praying for my kid. There's something wrong with this picture. Oh, I'm praying for my wife, I'm praying. But you tend to be more critical than you are positive about them, and you don't spend any time really seeking God. We need to become a people of prayer. Psalm 17.1, Hear a just cause, O Lord. Attend to my cry. Give ear to my prayer, which is not from deceitful lips. Proverbs 15.29, The Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. Acts 1.14, These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. With the woman and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers, they gathered together in prayer and supplication. Supplication, request. They made requests to God. Prayer's got to be a priority. We have intercessors that have really prayed us through this building. And, and this Thursday, it's this Thursday, isn't it? The last Thursday of this month, what time, Charlene? 5.30, they're coming together to pray. We need more people just to come and pray with them. It's, it's not about praying for your need. I'm going to come and let just, I'm going to hog all their time and tell them how bad it is. No, just come and pray for this city. Come and pray for this church. Take an hour, hour and a half. Come and pray. The key to revival is being desperate for God. Man, I'm watching people buy their new vehicles, man, and they're buying all their luxurious uh, luxuries and, and, and doing all that. And we're taking trips here and we're taking trips there. And we've got time for everything but Jesus. I'm not against any of that stuff, but it's become a priority over God. We don't pray anymore. When's the last time you prayed for me? Okay, I'm, I'm just going to make you be honest this morning. This morning, this week, if you prayed for me at some point this week, would you lift your hand? Awesome. I need more of you. I pray for you all the time. 
I lift you up before God. I ask God to bless your family. God will give me pictures of where you are, what's going on, and I'm praying for you. God, change them. Make them greater in you. Give them wisdom and revelation. I pray Ephesians 1, Ephesians 3 over you, over my family, over the staff, over their family. I ask God to take them. We need to be men and women of prayer. Greg, hit the sermon lights. I want to see these faces of these first two sections here, middle sections. We have a setting for sermons. There we go. You look so much brighter. We need some desperate believers. We need some hungry believers for Jesus, for something fresh, for something new, for more of God, for more anointing of God. Hello? We need God to move. I'm asking you as an individual at home to start praying more. It is a key that God has given us, and we're not taking advantage of, well, I don't know about my teenager. I'm not sure if they're going to make it. Man, quit looking for things that you can manipulate to make happen in their life, and just get on your face before God and pray for them. Quit trying to change your spouse and just get on your knees before God and pray for them and watch God work. Quit complaining about your boss and get on your knees and pray for God to change circumstances in your work environment. Have you ever been around somebody and all they do is complain about their employees? Oh my goodness. Oh, Harry drives me nuts. Every 15 minutes, he's taking a smoke break. I just, don't pray that Harry gets cancer. Pray that God just takes away the desire for cigarettes. Come on. When's the last time you prayed for Harry's cigarette addiction? When I worked at Decker's, I had a guy that smoked all the time, and, and you got to remember, I was only 16. So I bought those cigarette loads. I loaded up his cigarettes where they would explode. He was like 30 years old, and, and so he was driving home. I forgot about it. I loaded them all up in his cigarettes. I get so tired. He's taking a break all the time. I shouldn't have done this, but I did. He said, oh, and I'm driving home, and I light up a cigarette, and I start puffing, and all of a sudden it blows up. I about hit another car. I'm freaking out. What happened? You'd think he'd learn. He lit up another one. It blew up again. Then he said, I'm going to kill Owen. He's done this to me. Don't do that to Harry. I was young. I just thought it was funny. Compassion not only releases the power of God, it attracts the power of God. Let me say that again. Compassion not only releases the power of God, it attracts the power of God. When you have compassion for people and you're praying for people, it attracts God's power. God is a compassionate God, and when he sees your heart and your compassion to see the potential in them and you're praying for them, it attracts God. Number three, be a person of thankfulness. Be a person of thankfulness. Luke 17, 17. Jesus is walking along. Ten lepers come up to him. He prays for them. They are all healed. They are all healed. But only one came back and thanked him. Luke 17, 17. He's like, where are the other nine? They've gone on. Only one out of the ten... If you had leprosy and Jesus healed you, would you not be thanking Jesus? You've been excommunicated, set aside, put in exile, and Jesus heals you, and you've been delivered, and you, nine of you run off? No way. God has blessed us in so many ways. We need to be thankful for every breath we take. We need to be thankful for every blessing he gives us. 
We need to be thankful for a country where we have the freedom while we have the freedom. Amen? And I hope that freedom continues, but I'm going to be praying for this country, for these judges, for these legislators. I'm going to pray for these mayors and these governors and the president and the vice president. I'm praying for those in other countries. God, make a difference. Change their lives. There's power in prayer, but I want to give thanks for what God has put in my life. 1 Thessalonians 5.18, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. No matter what you want. Well, she called me a jerk today. Thank you, Lord, she called me a jerk. I needed that yesterday. I should have read my notes. Galatians 3.3, Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, but now you're being made Perfect by the flesh. What's Paul talking about? The Galatians going back to, to fleshly things. Stay in the spirit. Stay in the anointing. Quit going after things you want. We need to be thankful, gracious, full of adoration. We need God's spirit walking in all areas of our lives. How many of you need God's anointing on your life? Amen? We need his anointing. We need to flow in his anointing, not our flesh. His anointing stops us from becoming apathetic and doormats and dormant. We need his anointing. We need to seek his face and stop seeking his hand. Man, if I were God and all you ever did was pray and ask me to give you something, Lord, I need you to do this, Lord. Man, just thank him. I, I, I've told you this before, but I was taught the Acts method of praying. A for Acts, adoration. Give him adoration. C, confession, confess your sins. T, thankfulness, be thankful for all that God's done. And then S, supplication, acts, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. That's how I pray. That's how you need to pray. Is there anybody here this morning you want all that God has for you? Be ready. Be ready for him to change everything about you. Now I want to get to the heart of my message. I've got about 10 minutes. Be a person of thankfulness. Make prayer a priority. And then number four, be an overcomer. John 14, 12 says, He who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do and greater works than these because Christ has gone to the Father. We're going to do greater works than Jesus did because of what he has done for us and him going to the Father on our behalf. I'm ready for greater works in my life. I'm not going to be settling for mediocrity. I'm not going to settle for just apathetically, just, okay, God, I just like where I'm at. I'm not, and that's what I want to speak to you about right now. In verse 19 of 1 Kings chapter 19, God tells Elijah to go to this young man, Elisha. And Elisha was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him. He came from a very wealthy family. He wasn't poor. To have 12 yoke of oxen, you were in a wealthy family. And he was with the 12th, then Elijah passed by him and threw his mantle on him. Let's just pretend this is Elijah's mantle. I want you to go to that kid, Elisha. He's out there plowing. And I just want you put that mantle on him. He puts it on him. Something happened when the mantle of the man of God touched Elisha. When you get touched by God and you really get touched by God, your life changes forever. You know something's happened. You know you've been touched. He was touched. And all of a sudden he's like, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to chop up 
this plow, I'm going to sacrifice these oxen, and I'm following you, dude. Because I'm not sure who you are or what you have, but what you have, I want, because I felt it. Have you ever been around somebody, and they're so full of the Holy Spirit, when you get around them, you're like, I want what they have. I went to the house of prayer. I was there to pray for three days. I went to lunch with Mike Bickle, who runs the house of prayer. He told me his vision for 100,000 houses of prayer. He said, Owen, I don't know who you are, but I can tell you this much. I believe I'm supposed to hire you to be a worship leader, and you're going to travel. I have two. You'll be my third. I'm looking for ten. I'll pay you $100,000 to travel the world with me and set up houses of prayer. The anointing was so great on him, I couldn't even speak. Finally, he's like, what do you think? I'm like, man, I don't know. I don't know. My head's spinning right now. But I knew God was using this man. I went home. I sent my wife back to Kansas City. She spent time with him. We came back. We prayed. We felt like God said, no, stay here in Lafayette. I want you to start a church. But you get around somebody and they've got such an anointing because of what God has placed upon them. Elisha sees this guy. He's touched by this guy. And he starts following him. Now let's move on. Let's go to 2 Kings chapter 2. 2 Kings chapter 2. You see, God has placed an anointing on your life. God has greater things. You need to hug God's anointing every day. Amen? I mean, you need to hug it. Shall I stand up here? Just give me a big hug today. Hug God's anointing. Just give me a big hug. Oh, squeeze me tight, baby. Don't let go of this anointing. Oh, let me just put this mantle on you. More, God, more. You're not letting go, are you? All right. You can let go now. (laughs) She's not letting go. (laughs) You're so funny. (laughs) She's got me all flustered now. I tripped on this thing twice down there. Okay. So you got to hug the anointing. No matter what day you live in, amen? When there's all types of battles going on around you, when you're battling, you hug the anointing. God, now listen to this, this is so important. God has a tendency to anoint people that are workers for him. He does not anoint the sloth. You look all through Scripture... And everybody that God goes after, Elisha, he's out plowing. He's a worker. God tends to anoint workers. Not sluggards. Not sloths. That's important to realize that. In other words, you need to be busy about doing something so that you can attract God's attention and say, hey, here am I. Man, I'm willing to do it. Well, man, I just want God to change my marriage and make me a better man and, and, and make my wife a better wife. And, and I just want him to, you know, give me blessings financially and everything. But meanwhile, I'm going to sit in front of the TV and, and I'm going to do my stuff. Come on. He's looking for people that are busy. I'm telling you, there's truth in that. Not only do you need to be people of prayer, not only do you need to be people of thankfulness, you need to be people that are busy. You're using your time, your talent, and your treasure wherever you are, wherever, Caterpillar, Alorica, wherever God has placed you, your own business, you're busy about the kingdom, even at Nanshan. Amen, Keith? You see, I don't wonder, I, I no longer want to settle for ordinary, I want extraordinary. Elisha got a touch, and he was not satisfied. He's like, man, I want more. If that's a little bit that God can do, I want more. I've never been a person 
that's gone around looking for touch, but man, God seems to have touched me a lot of times, and every time he touches me, I'm like, God, I want more. There's got to be more. This is awesome. And that's what happened to Elisha. He got a little touch. He wasn't satisfied. He wanted more. He said, I'm going to leave what I'm doing. I'm going to leave my family. Come on, somebody get this. I'm going to leave my old behavior. I'm going to leave my old friends. I'm going to do some new things for God because I felt the touch of the mantle that the man of God was carrying. There's greater things in God. You know what he said? He cut it up and he said, now don't look back. Too many of us keep looking back. What's my old girlfriend doing? That guy that bought my business, how's he doing? Man, I, I just wish I'd have done. Quit living in your past. God wants you to look ahead. Hello? And finally, he's following Elijah, Elijah around, and Elijah finally says to Elisha, what is it you want? I want twice to what you got. Oh, you've asked for a hard thing. I want twice what you have. Let's look at chapter 2 there in 2 Kings. And it came to pass when the Lord was about to take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Then Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me unto Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives, and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they went to Bethel. Where is, what's Bethel? Bethel is the house of God. They went to the house of God. God wants you in church. He wants you coming to church. He wants you participating in church. He wants you being full of all that God has for you. But the problem is, most of us get some church, and then we just stay there at the church. There's still Monday through Saturday where God wants you doing more. But we've got people in America settling for a little dab. They stay at Bethel and they never go any further. Elisha said, I want all that you have for me. I want all that you have for me. Let's keep going. I've got to wrap this up, but this is good. He's going with him. And some prophets came at Bethel, and they said, Do you know that the Lord will take away your master from you today? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Then Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. Everybody say Jericho. You go to Bethel. That's the first test. You get in church. You get planted. You start. You quit running from church to church to church. No wonder churches aren't doing anything. We got people hopping all the time. Why? Because they don't want to go deeper with God. And when they get challenged, they start moving on. They come to Jericho, 2 Kings 2, 6. Jericho is a wicked place. As a matter of fact, when you look at Jericho, you look at Joshua chapter 6, verse 17, 18. Now the city shall be doomed by the Lord to destruction, it and all who are in it. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all that who are in her house, because she hid the messengers. And you by all means abstain from the accursed things, lest you become accursed. When you take of the accursed things, you make the camp of Israel a curse. So then Joshua charged them at that time, saying, Cursed be the man before God who rises up and builds this city, Jericho. Hello, God destroyed Jericho in Joshua, and he said that city would never be again. What do we find out with Elisha and Elijah? Not only have they rebuilt the city, Jericho, that God told them not, they are accursed, and now they move from Bethel, and they move to the cursed place, the, the place that represents the world, the things of the world, and now they're resting in Jericho. So some stay in the church, but then you move into the world, and you like what the world has to offer, so you stay right there. What does Elijah say to Elisha? Stay here. Stay here. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to the Jordan. And he said, As the Lord lives, 
Come on. And as your soul lives, I will not leave you. In other words, God, I want your anointing. It's not enough to be in church. I'm not going to be like the world. I'm not going to stay in Jericho. I'm going on to Jordan. Wherever you go, God, across the Jordan was the promised land. I'm going with you. He gets to the Jordan. He gets to the Jordan, and Elijah looks at him again. He says, you stay on this side. And he says, oh, no, 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 no. I didn't stay at Bethel. I didn't stay at Jericho. I'm going on. I'm not going to stay on this side of the Jordan. And Elijah takes the mantle, and he hits the Jordan, and the waters part, and they go over. Oh, my goodness. They go over. You see, the anointing means you're after God each and every day. You want more of what God has. There's more than just church, God. There's more than what the world has. There's more than the promised land. I want what you have and more, God. This is good preaching. I don't care how hungry you are. This is good preaching. Look at the word there. And Elijah took his mantle, verse 8 rolled it up and struck the water. And it was divided this way and that so that the two of them crossed over the dry ground. And so it was when they had crossed over. Everybody say cross over. When you get all that you can get and you stay planted in the church and you reject all that God has in the world, that the devil has in the world for the sake of God, and finally you get to the point where you've crossed over into the promised land, Elijah said to Elisha, what may I do for you before I go? And Elisha said, please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. So he said, you have asked for a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall be not so. Then it happened as they continued, oh, I love this part, as they talked, and suddenly a chariot of fire appeared. Come on now, a chariot of fire. When the Holy Spirit's fire gets on you and you start feeling the the heat of the Spirit, and you've been seeking God, you say, I'm just not going to live for church, God. I'm just not going to play once a week. I'm not going to go after what the world says, God. I've, I've, I've crossed over the Jordan. I'm not stopping on this side. I'm going into the promised land. I'm going to, and all of a sudden, you see the chariot of fire with the horses ablaze, and they're coming. All of a sudden, Elijah sees that. He looks at it, and he says, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and its horsemen. So he saw him no no more and he took hold of his own clothes and he tore them in two pieces and as Elijah was being carried up he took his mantle and he dropped it and Elisha picked up that mantle and he walks over to the Jordan and he says yeah and he hits that Jordan, and that water parts, and the prophets are going, oh, my goodness. He's picked up the anointing of our father, Elijah. But what they don't know is Elisha's got a double portion. Elisha's got a double portion. Stand with me this morning. I'm telling you, God wants to give you more than you could ever imagine. He wants to wrap that mantle of anointing all around you so that you can become the man of God that he has for you in a greater way than you could ever imagine. I believe that. I believe that. He's saying, grab the mantle. Take the mantle. I don't care if you're 81 years old and your body's aching all over. He says, grab the mantle because he's not done. You may be thinking more about the promised land. You may be thinking that you're going to stay in the promised land, but you're still here on old good old earth. And he's like, go and do what all I have for you. Take it, brother. With your heads bowed. You don't know Christ, you can receive him today and make Jesus Lord of your life. God, make us sanctified and consecrated before you. Lord, I don't want to be just righteous on Sunday and live like hell during the week. 
I want people to see a difference. And God, when you challenge me to take a new step in faith, I don't want to stand at the edge and say, I'm not sure I want to get in that water. God, I want to step out and watch you part the water. You see, there were a couple of clans in Israel, and they got ready to go to the promised land. And Reuben and Gad, they decided not to cross over the Jordan. They stayed. And they gave the Israelites fits for the rest of their lives because they wanted to stay on this side of the Jordan. God's speaking to some of you to do more for his kingdom, to let him pour into you to be the husband, the father, the wife, the mother, the son, the worker, the harvester, and you're holding back, you've got to step into the Jordan. It will cost you to stay if you don't move on with God. It's going to cost you. I don't want to pay that kind of price. There's always danger around the Jordan, but our God's a God of enough. He's a God of enough with your heads bowed. You say, well, I'm not just going to rest for Sunday. I'm not going to rest for living and smiling like a believer on Sunday, but living like the devil all week, smoking my dope, taking my pills, gossiping, looking at my pornography, stealing from my boss. And I come in here and smile and raise my hands. Spend all week lusting, wishing I had this, wishing I had that. It's time to quit living carnality out. I want to walk with you, Jesus, daily. And wherever you go, I want to go. I was thinking of Todd White. He has this great ministry all over the United States, and he had a dream. And in the dream, God said, I want you to take your family. I want you to move to Dallas, Texas. And he woke up that morning and went to his wife, and he said, God spoke to me in a dream last night, babe. He told me we're to move to Dallas, Texas. She goes, let's do it. Now that's what I'm talking about. A woman that's willing to say, God, whatever you want, if you speak to my husband, I'm going to do that. Most of you women would have a heart attack. But I looked at my wife and I said, I'm going to do what God wants me to do. I want a mighty harvest. I'm believing it for Lafayette, but I'm telling God I'm available for whatever and wherever he has. Because I want to see people come to Jesus. I'm not going to settle for showing off my dog, showing off my car. I'm not going to settle for showing off my position at work. I'm not going to settle for showing off this and showing off that and showing off this. And I'm not going to settle. There's more to life in the kingdom than those things that will pass. Are you getting it this morning? Fulfill the calling that God has placed in your life with heads bowed. It's available. Our God is more than enough. Will you call out this morning and say, God, give me a double portion, God. God, give me a greater anointing. Say that right now if you mean it in your heart. God, give me a greater anointing. God, give me a double portion. Lord, I want all that you have and more. I want to step out in faith and no longer be hesitant. Don't let me be stymied, Lord, at Bethel. Lord, don't let me be stymied by Jericho. God, I'm not going to look at the Jordan and fear the water. I'm going to just say, Lord, you make a way as I'm stepping out. Jesus, I pray for each person with heads bowed nobody looking around you say Owen I want to do that but to be honest with you I'm just gonna be straight up man I kind of like where I'm at and what I'm doing Would you just lift your hand up and tell me that don't don't lie just that's me I, I do I kind of hands going up I kind of like where I'm at I like what I'm doing God loves you so much and he's gifted you so much there's so much more he wants you to do 
Don't settle. Those that lifted your hand, just silently say this, God, I'm kind of comfortable, but Lord, take me to the next level. Whatever that means, stretch me. I want to go to the next level with you. Lord, I believe you're going to do that for him. Those that say, Lord, give me all you got. I'm serious. Lift your hand. Nobody look around you. Lift it. Give me all that you got. I want, I want it. Pour it out. That means you're going to radically change me, change my hobbies, change my habits, change what I'm doing, change, change friends, even, maybe even change employment, God. You're going to do it, but I want all that you have. That's me today, God. Lord, I pray for those that lifted their hand. Lord, a double portion, a fresh anointing, greater than they've ever seen, God. Lord, let them look back at Elisha and say, I want what Elisha had. I want double anointing. I want to be aware of what you're doing and let your Holy Spirit work through me. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Turn to somebody and say, oh, he did okay today. He did okay. All right. like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look.